I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, and it's a great pleasure to be here today with Charles Conn, the Warden of Rhodes House. So Charles, you've taken up this post as Warden of Rhodes House after a number of years away from Oxford. Tell us about your pathway to here. Um, sure. Well, it's really wonderful to be back. Um, I did a whole bunch of things when I was away. Um, I worked as a partner in McKinsey for a while. I worked up, I worked at starting um, tech companies on the west coast of the United States for a while. But for the last decade or so, I've been doing environmental grant making with Gordon Moore's foundation. And what's your impression coming to Oxford of what <coughs> Oxford needs to learn from the world of grant making and from the private sector? Um, well, first of all, Oxford has uh, learned a lot. It's really interesting to see how different a university it is 30 years later. And it's remarkable um, how much it's modernized and uh, to see the incredible improvement in graduate faculties right across the board, including your own Blavatnik School. So it, it's clear that Oxford has uh, substantially lifted its game, particularly in the graduate area. And so why take the wardenship? This is, for some, it, it seemed like a surprising move from, you know, somebody who's had such an impact on the business world. So what's, what was the aspiration which led you to take up being Warden of Rhodes House? You know, I think I was getting to the stage in my career where it, it seemed really wonderful to work with young people again. And to work, you know, it, working in the uh, environment world, uh, environment grant making world, I got to work with, you know, people who had terrific aspirations um, for the planet. But it's really wonderful to be back in Oxford and work with people who have aspirations in so many areas to improve the world uh, that is unfolding in front of us. And it's clear that, you know, we've left to this generation plenty of challenges in doing that. And do they, do the <coughs> young graduates that you're mixing with appreciate those challenges? Do you think they are focused on them? Yeah, I think they feel the weight of them um, perhaps even too heavily. Um, but yeah, they are, they're clearly focused on the challenges that are unfolding in a whole bunch of different areas. And I'm really pleased to see amongst them good science and medical graduates as well. So, so just taking the climate change issue, which is the one you were working on grant making in, yeah. now having spent the last couple of years dealing with the 20-something year olds who are passionate about bringing about change, would you d make grants any differently? Yeah, look, um, I think it's clear that while you can invest in science, you actually need to invest in advocacy as well. And it's really wonderful um, to be with young people who are willing to put time and actions against their beliefs um, as, as well as money. And how does the Rhodes Trust fit in with this? Um, yeah. Well, you know, the, the Rhodes Trust is in the business of identifying and developing uh, really talented young potential leaders across a broad variety of spheres. And whether the, whether the fight is in climate change or in deforestation or in, uh, you know, be better relations with the emerging uh, uh, brick powers, I, I think identifying young leaders who can, you know, in a, in a way take to the field is more important than ever. Is there a danger that we call them leaders before they're ready to lead? Probably. Um, but, you know, I think when we, when we pick scholars, we do look for an eight innate characteristics of leadership. And I think, you know, with 110 years of history, we've got a pretty good nose for it when we see it. So tell us about the innate qualities of leadership. Well, you know, and I, I think w when we talk about leadership, we often have an image of some white man out front telling other people what to do. And that's not the way we lead today, as, as you know, as, uh, better than anybody else, that the styles of leadership that will be prevalent in this 21st century will be ones that focus on collaboration and uh, people who are good at moving the group toward its common objective. And I think we can sense that and see that in, this, in the young scholars, both in their uh, historical backgrounds, but also in how they spend their time here. Mm. And do you think their time at Oxford helps them? What, in what way does it help them do all that better? Yeah, you know, and, and I, this is a wonderful question. And there's been this sort of magic in the Rhodes program, and I'm sure some of the other scholarship programs, that's hard to put your finger on. There's something about young people drawn from diverse backgrounds, coming from different countries, rubbing shoulders together, who are considering kind of the world's big problems and the world's big questions that seems to raise them up, uh, raise up their aspirations and raise up their achievement in ways that you know, are frankly hard to identify. Do you think it also makes them a little humbler? 
I mean, they, they arrive in Oxford and they realize they're surrounded by these outstanding other people. And some people think that it builds a sense of entitlement, but what I notice is that it actually builds some humility and some ability to listen because they're in a room a lot of the time with a whole bunch of people who are smarter than they are. Boy, uh, anyone who's not humbled by being here isn't paying attention. I, com I completely agree with your point that um, in almost every context in Oxford, you're, you're meeting people whose gifts are in different areas from your own, but are manifest. And I think that's, that may be the magic that you talked about that helps us be better than ourselves by understanding um, the different types of intelligence and capabilities of others. And why is that important for leaders? You know, I, I, I think it's very easy when you've operated in narrower ponds in your own country to, um, to sort of overbelieve your own story. And here you're constantly challenged by other perspectives, other ways of seeing the world uh, from both other disciplines but also other countries. And I, I think for anyone who is paying attention, um, that should question uh, the not, question not your aspirations for change, but all the ways you think about achieving change. So since you arrived in Oxford, <coughs> you've been out asking the world what they think of the Rhodes scheme, yes. what they think of Oxford. Um, what do they think of the Rhodes Scholarship Scheme and what do they think of Oxford? What are the positive and what are the negative things that people associate with us, some of which we might want to change and some of which we might want to hold on to? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, of course, we in uh, both institutions, Rhodes and Oxford, enjoy, you know, um, very deeply established brands. But I think it'd be um, a real mistake for us to rest on our laurels. Um, Oxford competes against uh, terrific universities on a number of continents now. And the Rhodes program competes, competes and collaborates with all the many other wonderful um, scholarship programs. I think people see in Rhodes uh, something unusual, and that is a focus on leadership, not just academic achievement. And I think that's our strength and that we really need to build on that. And I think Oxford has um, always been thought of as sort of the place of, you know, dreaming spires. And I'm really thrilled to see this new emphasis on pragmatism uh, and, you know, an actual interfacing with the world, not just being separate from it. Mm. So you've just got back from China. Yes. And in China you visited major universities yeah. and other organizations. So give us a snapshot of how they view Oxford, of how they view... Yeah, and I, you know, I think that <coughs> there's an... F first of all, they regard Oxford with, uh, you know, very high esteem. Uh, that's clear. But it's also clear that, you know, that there's an element of, um, you know, Oxford being trapped in amber. Um, and I think it is terribly important, the initiatives that, uh, that our, our recent vice chancellors have done to raise uh, the profile and to raise the aspirations of the university. And in a way to force all of us to lift our own game uh, in response to the planet's challenges. And um, I, th I think we need to constantly reestablish our reputation, especially in this emerging world. Mm, what does that mean for Rhodes? <coughs> I think for Rhodes it means an even greater and more explicit focus on helping to identify and develop these new collaborative leadership skills, rather than just hoping that those would happen osmotically in Oxford, which, you know, of course they often have had, ha have done, but to actually have a more explicit and structured conversation about collaboration and service-based leadership. Mm -hmm. So since the Rhodes Scholarship Scheme was um, created, mm -hmm. there's a lot of schemes around the world that are, that are attempting to identify leaders. What can we learn from those others? Um, look, uh, there's many different takes on how to do this and we're always looking at uh, the, the other organizations and, and, and what they've done. One of the things that um, we've been innovating um, on recently is how you do a structured conversation about leadership. Rather than having that be something that's taught to have something that comes out of conversation, structured readings and conversation. And that's something we've observed in um, other organizations such as the Aspen Institute. So two, two years in to being yeah. warden of Rhodes House and looking at the scholars coming through selected because of their leadership <coughs> potential, what is it you'd like to see more of? Ah, so I would, you know, so the truth is I'd like, to, we have done a wonderful job picking terrific all-arounders. 
And I think that really is the, you know, the staple of, of the Rhodes Program, people who have both terrific academic achievement, but also uh, achievements in these other areas. I'd like to see a few more candidates who have a slightly spikier profile, um, so that they haven't checked every box, but they have really um, significant strong suits, either in this leadership potential or in some other element of non-academic achievement. And then just one last question is, you left the world of environmental grant making behind. Mm. What do you miss? Uh, so, I, I, you know, this will sound silly to you, but the thing I miss the most is being in the places where you get to do environmental grant making. So, most of my work uh, before. So, so, what does that mean, being so, there? Well, so I was in British Columbia, Alaska, Russia's Kamchatka, uh, the northern part of Japan, and a lot of the work um, that we did in, 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 in the, the grant making I was doing, which was in marine ecosystems. Uh, involved being with scientists in, you know, in the wild, so to speak. And um, I miss that. I, I have to admit, I miss that. Charles Kahn, thank you very much for agreeing to have this conversation as part of Voices from Oxford. It's been my great pleasure, Mary. Thank you.